God on, on um, the land of Egypt. It's a pretty unique passage. Uh, I'm Pastor Dave Couyers from Country Bible Church in Boonville, California, and I hope to get this published on YouTube also, uh, but probably not on slideshare.net forward slash D Couyers. But we're going to look at two chapters. I had hoped to do all four chapters today because it's a block on Egypt, um, but we're only going to do 29 and 30 today. So I found a new Old Testament timeline. I just wanted to go over this a minute with you. Around 4000 BC, we had God spoke the universe into existence. Then we have the Garden of Eden account and chapter 2. And then chapter 3 of Genesis, we have the fall of mankind. And then chapter 6 through 9, we have the flood of Noah. The time of the patriarchs. Uh, and their journey, there's actually two journeys down into Egypt, and that's one of the reasons I want to bring this up. Both Abraham and Isaac ended up fleeing to Egypt for different reasons, and both of them um, ended up denying that their wife was their wife, but their half-sister, and that caused them both grief. Then we have the rescue out of, uh, out of Egypt. Of So 70 people went into Egypt, and they came out um, a couple of million people strong coming out of it at the end of the Exodus. And then their disobedience brought in 40 years of wilderness wandering up to Mount Sinai, where the nation of Israel is, they go from being a family to a nation at Mount Sinai, about 1445 BC. And then, then we get into the period of, jo of Joshua and, and <clears throat> the conquest of the land that God had given the nation of Israel. Uh, and they didn't get the whole thing. The land grant that was given to them goes from the river Euphrates all the way up to Lebanon, all the way down to the, the river of Egypt. Um, and then they just got the small little, you know, 10% of it that they currently have. Then we have the period of the judges where it repeatedly says that there was no king in Israel at that time, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. It's a, it's a rough period of time, the period of judgments. Um, and here we have, they have the establishment of Israel. Uh, it's around 1445 BC uh, at Mount Sinai. So, no, Mount Sinai is back here where they become a nation. Here, here's where they, they gain the land. Uh, and divide up the land. Then we go into the period of the kings of Israel. And remember there is zero good kings in the northern kingdom. And there's d twice as many as zero in the southern kingdom. There's eight good kings in the southern. Uh, Benjamin and Israel or Judah. And zero good kings in the northern kingdom. And then, but their sin and disobedience finally brings the judgment. God says, you owe me 70 years. You're going into captivity in Babylon for 70 years. And so 586 BC, about the time we're at now, we're right, I've added that red line. That's about where we're at, right at that. Today, we're going to look at time before and after the, the uh, fall of Jerusalem, but to, to King Nebuchadnezzar. And then the period as they return from the Babylonian captivity, we get Ezra and, uh, and the other one that are the return books. Uh, Esther is the other word I was trying to think. And then we're going to get a glimpse when we get in towards the end of Ezekiel of the new heavens and new earth uh, and the millennial temple in um, Ezekiel uh, the last nine chapters of Ezekiel. And then we go into what's called the silent years, 450 years of um, no, no messages, no prophets from God, no, no speaking to the nation of Israel. Uh, and 2 Maccabees says, tells us, it historically records that there was no prophet in the land at that time. So that takes us then at the end of the silent years is then the virgin birth and the New Testament period. So interesting because we get four chapters here in Ezekiel, and all four of them are prophecies against it, the nation of Egypt. 
And uh, think of Egypt as like a next door neighbor almost of, I mean, it's, there's Sinai Desert there kind of separates them, but they're still next door neighbors. So Ezekiel comes up, I mean, Egypt comes up so much. I'm going to show you the, the stats on it here in a little bit. But So I want to just give you a little refresher on what some of the current information that we've uh, archaeologists have dug up on Egypt and just the glory of them. Uh, amazing Egyptian Photos says, after searching for years by screening the vast area of the Akubkir Bay off the coast of Egypt, French archaeologist Frank Godio and his team saw a colossal face emerge from the watery shadows. Godio had finally encountered Phonus Heracleon completely submerged six and a half kilometers off Alexandria's coast. Among the underwater ruins were 64 ships, 700 anchors, a treasure trove of gold coins, statues standing at 16 feet, and most notably the remains of a massive temple to Amun Gareb and the tiny sarcophagi for the animals that were brought there as offerings. The ruins and artifacts from granite and diorite are remarkably preserved and give a glimpse into what was 2,300 years ago, one of the great port cities of the world, the harbor of Thonis, Heracleon, and the Egyptian and Greek names for the city controlled all the trade into Egypt. So we've got a huge port city that they've just dug up. And most of these pictures that come up now are of that find. Look at this obelisk that they've got with the hieroglyphics in here. We now can read that. You know, 100 years ago, we couldn't have. We had to find that, that one stone, uh, Rosetta Stone, that was in three languages, and that broke the, broke the code on, on uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. Why is that important? It's profoundly important if you start talking to a Mormon. That is proof that Mormonism is a lie from the pit of hell. Uh, there, I've got a really good video if you ever want to encounter about the book of Abraham. Uh, Joseph Smith claimed that he, he was a seer and he could look into his hat and he could translate. He got direct oracles from God. And from a traveling salesman, he bought the book of, of Abraham, uh, which was all Egyptian hieroglyphics. And Joseph Smith translated it under his spell, under his channeling demons that he did. And he translated the book. Not too many years later, they found the Rosetta Stone and cracked the code on Egyptian hieroglyphics. So there's no question of what we can read and decipher and discern all of those hieroglyphics now because of the Rosetta Stone. So there's a team of scholars that went back and did this video on the Book of Abraham. And what they found was the entire thing was a bold-faced lie, has no basis in reality. He was just strictly channeling demons or making it up on his own. So, but this is another one. Now that we have the Rosetta Stone, we can read that. We know what it says. Look at the statuaries they found out there. And no indication of what happened with the landmass to have submerged all this or if they were all on ships that got sunk. It doesn't really say. But massive 16-foot statues that are sunk out there. Look at the size of this stone and the gold chair, golden throne. Look at that. The wealth of Egypt, Egypt is beyond comprehension. Judith and I were blessed to be able to see the little partial display that they had of King Tut's tomb. And it was, they were, I think they said it was 10% of the treasures that he found. Uh, David Hawking has seen the real treasures down underneath the pyramids. And he's seen that display, and he laughs at it. He goes, it's not nowhere near that much. He says it isn't even a, a partial percentage, single-digit percentage. But look at, these, look at these beautiful columns they've made and all decorated and ornamented. And just the mystery of the, of the Great Pyramids is mind-boggling. So why am I taking you through this? I want you to be fresh in your mind the majesty of ancient Egypt. They ruled the world. When Joseph went down there, when the Israelites went into to there, the whole world was bringing them tribute. 
They sold grain to everybody. Everybody that didn't come and bring their, their treasures to Egypt starved. They didn't get the wheat. And God had blessed them for seven years before that and, and had Joseph build store grain houses so that they purchased all of these wealth and treasures from all the nations. And they were ruling the world, the major, major power. But, I mean, the, the majesty of these pyramids and the precision of them in every, in every way is beyond our comprehension. The Great Pyramid of Giza truly is. The, to build the Great Pyramid, it took more than 2.3 million limestone and granite blocks with each block of stone in the pyramid weighing at least two tons. The weight of the granite blocks of stone in the in the ceiling of the king's chamber was between 50 to 80 tons. Look at the size of this lady there. And bear in mind that, that we're now seeing the, the rough stud work, the underpinning of it. On top of that would have been the, the face stones that were all robbed off by grave robbers. And then on top of that, they would have plastered it. It would have been beautiful and white. Here you can see what, the outside layer of finished stones. Did you know that the height of the Great Pyramids is 149.4 meters and the distance between the Earth and the Sun is 149.4 million kilometers? This is considered one of the mysteries of the pharaohs. San, Sean Sanders replied, Did you know that the height is 43,200 uh, 43, to 1 ratio of the polar radius of the Earth and the perimeter is a 43,200 to 1 ratio of the equatorial circumference. Phi and pi are rampant throughout its construction. It's aligned to true north within 0.05 of a degree. And some dudes with crude measuring tools, techniques, and Stone Age tools made it? I don't think so. Uh, he didn't touch on it here. But the foundation of one of them is 11 acres, and it's level within a half of an inch. They don't know how they leveled it. You can't do that with water levels and stuff. You know, we can't do it now with, with laser guidance tools, surveying instruments that go that. But they did a 11 acre pad that's flat within a half of an inch. Look at the size of this gate compared to those people. Amazing work, just flat out amazing work. Most of which we can't duplicate now. This is an incomplete obelisk in Aswan. And it looks like they carved it all out of the stone and then they were in the process of freeing it up to remove it when it cracked, is my interpretation of this. But huge. As it's called one of the most, one of the wonders of the world which is considered a mystery of the secrets of the ancient Egyptians. The incomplete obelisk of Aswan was first revealed in 1921 and is now 100 years since its discovery. And it is the largest obelisk in the world. Giant obelisk is a single piece of red granite, 42 meters long and 1,168 tons. Red granite contains quartz by 20 to 80 percent, which means that it's very hard rock. It cannot be cut with machines that were available to the pharaohs at the time, such as copper, bronze, and diorite. If we suppose that a strong man can lift 200 kilograms, then we will need 6,000 men just to lift this obelisk from its place. How was that obelisk cut, and how were they planning to move it with such a huge weight? The missing obelisk is one of the monuments that confirm a clear fact that there was once sophisticated technology in the ancient Egypt, technology that the world has not yet reached. We still can't do something like that. We don't have the ability. Uh, here you can see their bias and their ignorite, uh, basically saying that iron was not available to them. Well, that's a lie from the pit of hell. If they would read the Bible, they'd find out in Genesis 4 that that uh, Tubal-Cain was a worker of iron. And, and we know that the, shortly in this period, the Canaanites, uh, shortly after this period, I meant, the Canaanites had iron and chariots and on and on. So, 
we're looking at the framework around 571 BC, and we're talking about this region here. You want to remember that the terms Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt are upside down for us from a perspective on a map. It has to do with the way the water drains. The water drains down here, so the elevation is lower Egypt is in the north, and upper Egypt is in the south. Um, and all of these countries are going to be involved when we get to Ezekiel 38 also. Um, Ezekiel prophesied that even the great nation of Egypt and its allies would fall to the Babylonians, who already occupied the land of Israel and Judah. The rule of the Babylonians would eventually extend as far as the borders of Cush, referred to elsewhere as Ethiopia. None of the great cities of Egypt would be spared from Babylon's wrath. I'll give you a quick overview. What happened was the Babylonians were coming against Israel. The king of Israel sent for Egypt to come rescue them rather than calling out to the Lord God. And Egypt came up to try to rescue them. And they got engaged in the siege and then backed away and allowed Jerusalem to fall to the Babylonians in our time frame in Ezekiel. So it was, uh, that's why they're called a reed that gives way or breaks and wrenches the shoulder and God, God cuts them no slack. Uh, Israel had a long history of relying on Egypt rather than God. Crocodile armor, 3rd century A.D., found in Manfalut Isut on the banks of Nile in Upper Egypt, uh, Roman Egypt, and British Museum credited it. So a suit of armor made out of crocodile skin. And remember, they worship crocodiles also, and he's going to be in our text today also. And they thought that um, crocodiles were, they worshiped crocodiles also. Let's read uh, Ezekiel 29. I don't think we need to turn in your Bibles, if you would, so you know that you've got it. But I think, uh, no, I didn't either. Next chapter, I, I put up on the screen the whole thing. But here we need to actually physically flip the pages and get to chapter 29. And we will read it, the whole chapter. And I'm going to start out, and I'll call out the verses as you guys catch up. Ezekiel chapter 29. In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, verse 2, Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him, against all Egypt, verse 3, speaking and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great monster that lies in the midst of the rivers, that is, has said, My Nile is mine, and I myself have made it. Verse 4. I will put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your rivers cling to your scales. And I will bring you up out of the midst of your rivers. And all the fish of your rivers will cling to your scales. Verse 5. I will abandon you to the wilderness. And you and all the fish of your rivers, you will fall in the open field. You will not be brought together or gathered. I have given you for food to the beasts of the earth and to the birds of the sky. Verse 6. Then all the inhabitants of Egypt will know that I am the Lord, because they have been only a staff made of reed to the house of Israel. When they took hold of you with, with the hand, you broke and tore all their hands. And when they leaned on you, you broke and made all of their loins quake. Verse 9. Verse 8. Verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon you a sword, and it will cut you off from man and beast. The land of Egypt will become a desolation and a waste. They will know that I am the Lord, because you said, The Nile is mine, and I have made it. Therefore, behold, I am against you and against your rivers, and I will make the land of Egypt an utter waste and desolation. From Migdal to Cyrene, and even to the border of Ethiopia. 11. A man's foot will not pass through it, and the foot of a beast will not pass through it, and it will not be inhabited for 40 years. So I will make the land of Egypt a desolation, in the midst of desolated lands, 
and her cities in the midst of cities that are laid waste will be desolate forty years, and I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the lands. 13. Thus says the Lord God, at the end of forty years I will gather the Egyptians from the peoples among whom they were scattered. I will turn the fortunes of Egypt and make them return to the land of Pathos, to the land of their origin, and they will be a lowly kingdom. It will be the lowest of the kingdoms, and it will never again lift itself up against the nations. And I will make them so small that they will not rule over the nations. Uh, and it will never again be the confidence of the house of Israel, bringing to mind the iniquity of their having returned, having turned to Egypt, then they will know that I am the Lord God. 17. Now in the 27th year, in the first month, on the first of the month, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made his army labor hard against Tyre. Every head was made bald and every shoulder was rubbed bare. But he and his army had no wages from Tyre for the labor that he had performed against it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am going to give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will carry away her wealth and capture her spoil and seize her plunder, and it will be wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor which he performed, because they acted for me, declares the Lord God. On that day I will make a horn sprout from the house of Israel, and I will open your mouth in their midst, and they will know that I am the Lord. I spared you current pictures of Israel, of Egypt than the abject poverty that they're in. But and I've never been to Egypt yet. We haven't the Lord hasn't been blessed us with that yet. We've tried a couple times, but I really want to go if we ever get around to traveling again. But uh, every account that I get from a number of scholars say that it is one of the most, um, uh, it's, it's a really, really poor third world country. And we, we're talking about a country that ruled the world. Wealth that is beyond imagination. Wealth like has never been accumulated before or probably will be accumulated against. And we just read that God says they're never going to do that again. They're never going to rule the nations again. They're never going to see that kind of prosperity. They're going to be a base nation. And that's exactly what has happened in prophecy. Why? I think the, God gives the reason over and over again. You said, I created the Nile. You know, and that's the immediate punishment that he's pouring out on them. What do I think is probably a greater condition is the fact that that the new pharaoh at the Exodus turned against Israel and enslaved them and abused them for hundreds of years. And then each one of these pharaohs since then has taken advantage of Israel. And Genesis 12, 1 through 4 is still in effect. God says, whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And Egypt is the classic example of that. They went from the number one nation in the world to one of the very lowest of nations. Again, I'm going to include a few of David Hawking's um, notes today from his book of Ezekiel study. And remember, we're going to look at this map here. This is the blow up of that map. And it's, you remember, it started after chapter 24. Chapters 1 through 4 were about the commissioning of. Ezekiel and, and other things. And then we had 20 chapters about curses on Israel because of their idolatry. And then we slipped into 25 through 28 where the curses against all of the surrounding, they went clockwise around it, all of the surrounding nations. And now we're down here finishing up with chapters 29 to 32, which are four solid chapters of judgment against Egypt. So that's where we're at. Uh, his notes on uh, 29 through 30, verse 26, for David Hawking notes, says, Note, notice the dates of the particular second of, section of Ezekiel's prophecy. 
Uh, Ezekiel 29, 1, 17, 31, 1, 32, 1, and 17. Six of the seven messages in these four chapters have a date attached. The third one does not, and I might add here to his notes, that scholars are divided over it. I believe the best scholarship is saying that this little, the third section here, is a flashback in time, and, it, and it's looking back about three or four years. And, and so it's not chronological. And I think they're right, but scholars are divided over it. David Hawking goes on, the pride of Egypt will bring God's punishment. Chapters 29, 1 through 30, all the way through 30, verse 6. Note, he says, we read the words, set they, thy face, it's, I think it's thy face, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. And the words, I am against thee, in Ezekiel 29, 2, 3, 10, and 30, verse 22. This first message is dated January 7th, 587 B.C., about seven months before Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon. So we've got this little flashback that, you know, of how it fits in there. These dates... Let me reiterate, I've told you this before, it's important, I want you to pay attention. These kinds of dates in the Bible, that you can go into secular history and pin it down exactly, are unique to God's Word. No other holy book on the planet has this kind of precision built into it, where you can go and verify it. Only the Bible has this sort of thing. And three out of the four of these prophecies the Lord records the exact day when Ezekiel got the prophecy. And it's also the day that he got the prophecy, not the day that the prophecy was fulfilled. Also, you might make note of that when you're trying to reconcile the dates here, if you're interested in it. Pharaoh Hophra, David Hawking goes on, ruled Egypt from uh, 589 to 570 B.C. And you should read Jeremiah 40, verse 30, uh, and Jeremiah 36, and a number of other places where these things are, are repeated, if you would, almost as, with a little elaboration. And the main reason for this judgment comes about in uh, the first seven verses we're going to look at. Um, Pharaoh Hophra is a very interesting character, and I'm going to try and show you that in a minute, I think. Okay, I, I got downloaded another clip here. Uh, Mark uh, Hitchcock is one of the better Bible teachers that are available to you. His stuff is almost all for free. You can sign up, get it every week, get his up weekly update that he does. He calls them Marking the Times as a series. And this one is in Ezekiel chapter 30 and Ezekiel 29 about Egypt. So I want to take a few minutes and play this for you. <laughs> joining us for another episode of uh, Marking the Times. I uh, appreciate you all so much uh, coming and uh, viewing these videos every week and telling other people about them and kind of reposting them and whatever you want to do to kind of get the, the message out. Um, we appreciate the questions that you all send in and uh, I want to answer one of those today. It's a question about Egypt. Um, you know, we hear about Egypt a lot really today um, in relationship to the nation of Israel over there in the Middle East. Uh, you know, there's an old saying that uh, you can never have uh, peace in the Middle East without Syria, but you can never have war in the Middle East without Egypt. And I think that's certainly true. You know, we've seen that throughout history. Um, the question that was sent in, though, is a good one, and uh, it's going to get us into a passage of Scripture and kind of try our, our skills of interpretation. Uh, the, the lady asked this question. She says, I have a question about Ezekiel 29. I've heard a message from, and she mentions a well-known Bible teacher, that he believes the prophecies against Egypt have been fulfilled. A different person I heard on the topic, she mentions his name, believes it's still future. Um, I have, I've come to appreciate the Bible's literal fulfillment, therefore I struggle with the 40 years of desolation in Egypt. I think that would be a rather obvious, notable event in world history, but I don't think so. Um, if not, is it a future prophecy? And uh, let me just mention a little bit and put this passage in its setting here. In all of the, the major prophets, or in three of the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, you have a section where they deal with the nations surrounding Israel. I um, mean, Isaiah, it's chapters 13 to 23. 
in uh, the book of uh, Jeremiah, chapters 46 to 52, and here in Ezekiel, it's chapters uh, 25 to 32. So they kind of have these sections in their book where they deal with, with the surrounding nations, the, the Gentile nations around Israel. Now, one of the, the problems, one of the difficulties in these passages, I think, is discerning which prophecies in there have already been fulfilled and which ones are still future. And it's not always easy to discern that, so this is a good question. Uh, but here in, in Ezekiel, in this section, in Ezekiel 29, he talks about Egypt. And Egypt is also mentioned in Isaiah 19 and in Jeremiah 46. So each of these passages mention Egypt. Also, um, Egypt is mentioned in the end times as the king of the south in, in Daniel chapter 11. But here in Ezekiel 25 to 32, we have a, a cycle of seven judgments of nations. And the final one is Egypt. And Egypt is talked about in, in chapters 29 to 32. It gets a lot more coverage than any of the other nations. But it starts out in, in uh, Ezekiel 29 verse 1. It says, In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him, against all Egypt. Now we know from the time of this that the uh, king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, was a man named Hophra. And it goes on to talk about what's going to happen to Egypt. And he says down at the end of verse 9, Because you have said denial is mine, and I have made it, therefore behold, I am against you and against your rivers, and I will make the land of Egypt an utter waste and desolation. Uh, from Migdol to Syene, even to the border of Ethiopia. So it's basically saying from the north down to the south. A man's foot will not pass through it, and the foot of a beast will not pass through it, and it will not be inhabited for 40 years. And he goes on and he says, It will be desolate for 40 years. I'll scatter the Egyptians. But at the end of 40 years, I'll gather the Egyptians from the people among whom they're scattered. So three times you have this mention of a 40-year period when, when the, the land of Egypt will be a desolation. Now, I take this to be something that's already been fulfilled. That bothers some people because they say, well, we don't know of a time historically when Egypt was desolate for 40 years. Well, we don't know everything about ancient history. Not every period of time is recorded. We do know that Nebuchadnezzar came and defeated the Egyptians in 568, 567 BC. And I think that's probably when this was fulfilled because after this prophecy, he then goes on to talk about um, some near events in uh, the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. So since this passage here is bracketed by a near prophecy mentioning a, a pharaoh named Hophra, and right after this passage he mentions Nebuchadnezzar, who also obviously was a contemporary king with Ezekiel, I put the information here in between those two statements in the near future back in uh, Ezekiel's day. So I think there was a time when this was fulfilled, when the Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Egypt, and this 40-year time period was fulfilled in the past. We don't want to miss the reason for this, though, why God tells the Jewish people about this. Down in uh, verse uh, 15, he says, Egypt will be the lowest of the kingdoms. It will never again lift itself up above the nations, and I shall make them so small that they will not rule the nations. It's fascinating. Egypt, after the Persians came to power, after the Babylonians passed off the scene, has never been a great international power since that time. So that prophecy of God has been fulfilled and is still fulfilled today. And then he says in verse 16, It will never again be the confidence of the house of Israel, bringing to mind the iniquity of their having turned to Egypt. Then they will know I'm the Lord their God. One of the problems is the Jewish people at that time were uh, you know, being dominated by the Babylonians, and they turned to the Egyptians to try to help them. And the Lord is saying, you're never going to turn to the Egyptians again because they're never going to be a great power. And so it was really a lesson to them not to be dependent on anyone other than Yahweh because uh, the arm of the flesh would always fail them every time. And, and that's a good lesson for us as well, not to turn to other things and uh, be dependent on ourselves or our resources or our own sufficiency, uh, but to be dependent on the Lord uh, to meet our needs. Well, if that helps in answering that question, uh, maybe we'll answer some more questions next time, or we'll see kind of some things that are happening in our world today that fit in with Bible prophecy. But thank you again for joining us for another episode. God bless you. I hope you have a good week. Mark Hitchcock is, is a very, very good Bible teacher. I highly recommend him. Him and Andy Woods and Arnold Fruchtenbaum and Tommy Ice and a couple others are right up there at the top of my pecking list on, on good teachers to listen to. Bear in mind, there are no infallible teachers. 
the, only the Lord and only the Word of God. So, and and some of them I can nitpick on a few of them, but um, there really are very skilled Bible exegetes. So, verse one: In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth of the month, and that's January seventh, five eighty-seven B.C. Word of the Lord came to me saying, and that's, I clipped it out of the NIV study. I finally found out how to take a picture of, in my new Bible program, it's easier than trying to get the reference other ways. Um, So this is between the second and third sieges of Jerusalem. Remember the Babylonians came in about 606 BC and did the first siege of Jerusalem. And then they set up a vassal king, went back to Babylon, took some spoils with them, took a few slaves. Daniel and his cohorts were in the first deport. Then the second, 597 BC, the Babylonians came back. They had another rebellion to deal with. They, they went, had another siege, killed off the, the vassal king, installed another vassal king, took some more plunder, went back to Babylon and hoped things would work out well this time. And that's when Ezekiel went into captivity. And now we're between the second and third sieges of Jerusalem. We're right on the threshold of the collapse of Jerusalem and the destruction of it. And I say no other holy book has this kind of precise ties to secular history. You can literally go, fly over to England, go to the London Museum or the German museums and go dig up, look at the artifacts that they've dug up that show all of the eyewitness testimony that, that proves the Bible was true and accurate. So Egypt is an interesting case. It's mentioned in the NAU about 623 times. This doesn't include Egyptians or Egyptian plural or any of the other forms of the word. All I searched on was E-G-Y-P-T. Came up with 623 hits in the NAU most of which are, of course, in Exodus because that they were being removed from Egypt. And Genesis, with those two or three uh, excursions down into Egypt, Genesis, God specifically tell them, don't go back to Egypt a couple of times. And what do they do? They go back to Egypt. Another thing is you're reading through your text and you find the word Egypt and you come across it. I think... Um, that if you would automatically wonder, is it possible that Egypt is a picture of the world and that I should be reminded that I can do the same thing, I can go back into the world for my strength and my nurturing and my whatever else, just like the Jews continually do going back into the world when they go back to Egypt for for their protection, for their provision, for their sustenance when there's a famine in the land, rather than crying out to God. And God rebukes them for it over and over and over again. So anyway, as I will pull short. There's only, Dr. Zuck only lists 17 types that are mentioned in the New Testament. But I highly encourage you whenever you see a, a number of things. If you see the sea, start thinking about Gentiles. If you see the land, start thinking about Israel. If you see Egypt, start thinking about the world and see if it fits with the surrounding context. Ezekiel 29, verse 2. Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh. We're talking about Pharaoh Hophra. Um, And I don't know what I've done there. The nine, it should have been a quote probably. It's 588 to 569 B.C. Remember, the years are counting down backwards. The king of Egypt, or Pharaoh, or ruler of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. So this is the, all of those mentions of Egypt. There's 623 uses of the word Egypt as compared to uh, Israel, 2,569 uses of the word Israel, and mostly in numbers, but a lot of others. Uh, clearly, Israel is the most often referred to nation above any nation. And then I think second place would be Egypt. I didn't do, I didn't search for Tyre or Sidon or uh, a lot of other nations. I didn't bother with it. But I believe it's uh, Israel and then Egypt and then Babylon comes in third place. 
Uh, Babylon's mentioned 294 times in the NAU of the word Babylon. Again, it doesn't include Babylonians, Babylonia, or anything else, but just the word Babylon. And most of them are in Jeremiah. You're going to see a lot of references where you should go back and examine Isaiah and especially Jeremiah when you're doing a study of Egypt. Verse 3. Speak and say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great monster that lies in the midst of the rivers, that has said, My Nile is mine, and I myself have made it. Okay, I just remembered why we've got that nine that popped up before the 588, and this verse also, uh, Judith on 29.3, great monster. That number there, my Bible program got updated, and it started inserting the footnote numbers again. So I think I've got it fixed, but I've got to go through and fix this PowerPoint. So, but this word monster here is the Hebrew word tanim. It's not the one for Leviathan. I went back in to double check because I thought, I'll bet you anything that's that word Leviathan again. And we think that's a, the sea dragon. Uh, but this is a serpent or a dragger or a sea monster, a tanim. Same word for when Jodah was swallowed by a great whale, a lot of the translations will say. We know it wasn't a whale. Whales can't swallow that kind of a human. But we know that it's a great fish or a great dragon or a great serpent is what swallowed Jonah. It was actually a tanin, same as the one that they're saying in there. And if you look in almost all your notes of your study Bibles or commentaries, they'll put in crocodile. They believed it was a huge crocodile. Wouldn't rule it out. Seems to be unanimous among the commentators. Um, again, we're going to look at another quote from David Hawking on 4 and 5. The punishment of the dragon. Uh, first, the verse. 29.4. I will put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your rivers cling to your scales, and I will bring you up out of the midst of your rivers, and all the fish of your rivers will cling to your scales. I will abandon you to the wilderness, and all the fish of your rivers you and all the fish of your rivers. You will fall in the open field. You will not be brought together or gathered together. I have given you as food to the beasts of the earth and to the birds of the sky. And he's talking about Pharaoh. This is important. I want you to understand that God is saying you're going to be abandoned to the wilderness. And this is exactly what happened in history. He goes on. David Hawking's note says, Note, Pharaoh Hophra claimed that the Nile River was made by him and belonged to him. Like a ferocious crocodile, he attacked everyone who challenged his claim. The punishment of the dragon in verses 4 and 5 uh, is a judgment upon Egypt. And it's uh, from 29.1, our passage, through the end of today. But his note says, Pharaoh Hopfer was buried like an unwanted animal. Most of the pharaohs made elaborate preparations for their lives for their burial places. So you can go over there and see the Egyptian pyramids, and they were built as tombs for the pharaohs. They had a high regard for the afterlife. So they would be buried with their servants and with their armies, with all their wealth and riches and food and all the provisions they'd need because they believed in an afterlife. And they had a high regard for what their position would be in the afterlife. Pharaoh Hophra, on the other hand, because of what God said, didn't get a pyramid. He didn't even get a decent burial that's recorded that they drug him out in the wilderness and they threw his body out there to be ravaged by wild animals and scattered. So nobody will ever come up with a tomb or another pyramid for Pharaoh Hophra. Why? Because God said so. That's what I believe. Uh, and Mark touched on this. What's, what's going on with the 40 years? Verse 13, For thus says the Lord God, At the end of 40 years I will gather the Egyptians from the peoples among whom they were scattered. And I believe that was literally, historically fulfilled with the Medes and Persians when Cyrus sent them back, sent the Jews back also. Uh, Ryrie Study Bible, Dr. Ryrie says, at the end of 40 years, because of the lenient policy Persia had towards subject nations, the captives were allowed to go home. So Dr. Ryrie obviously is in the camp that believes that the 40 years were 
the a captivity by Nebuchadnezzar that went into history for 40 years and they went into captivity much like the Jews did for 70 years and that they were returned also when the Medes and Persians came to power and sent them all home. And not only did the Jews get to go home, they got to take all their treasures with them back to a rebuilt temple. Verse 17, Now in the 27th year, in the first month, in the first of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, So this is the date that Ezekiel received the prophecy from God. Because of his 13-year unprofitable siege against Tyre, God gave King Neb Egypt. Okay, we're talking about, remember, flashback, if you would, to Ezekiel 26 and through 28, I believe, the prophecies against Tyre. He said that, you know, the, the rubble would be stripped down to the bedrock, that Tyre would be this great nation, Tyre, that was a major financial center of the world and the shipping magnet of the entire world at that point. And all the goods and services went back and forth through Tyre. But when King Neb came and set up a 13-year siege against him, they built boats, they took their boats, and they moved offshore. And, uh, and King Neb got no spoil. So that's what's going on. And God says, I owe him, basically, because of the labor that he did for me against Tyre, but he didn't get any goodies out of it. Then hundreds of years later, we have King Alexander come and finish that prophecy of Ezekiel 26, and literally, they scraped it down to the bedrock and they made it a place of spreading fishnets, meaning there was a remaining little village there, a fishing village, but there was no longer a, a New York City kind of wealth center. So this is kind of, this is that th middle prophecy, the third one. Ezekiel didn't date this prophecy against Egypt like he has most others. The last dated prophecy in the book of Ezekiel was April 26th, 571 B.C. Time we get to our verse in 2917. Uh, however, Babylon's judgment on Egypt is well recorded. Okay, Babylon came and whooped them and took everything they had that they could find. Um, but there are four sections to our section here, each beginning with, thus says the Lord God, or something like that. And each one of those breaks up the divisions of, of this chapter, chapter 30, uh, at verse 2, verse 6, verse 10, and verse 13. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God, Wail, alas for the day, for the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a day of doom for the nations. A sword will come against Egypt and anguish will be in Ethiopia. When the slain fall in Egypt, they take away her wealth, and her foundations are torn down. Ethiopia, Put, Lud, all Arabia, Libya, and all the peoples of the land that is in league with will fall by them by the sword. You wonder why there's this poverty, even though they've got all the world's oil over there? This is because of the prophecy that God's given them. So the big question in verse 3 is, are we talking about a, a past judgment or a yet future judgment? Ezekiel 30, verse 3. For the day of the Lord, for the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. Okay, I just showed you the video clip of one of my favorite Bible teachers who put it in the past as a fulfillment of... Um, the Babylonian judgment, and then the Persian, Medio Persian kings sending them back after 40 years. And I think he's right. But I think there's a little deeper, deeper message here that the Word of God has. When I find everywhere in Scripture where it says the day with the definite article in front of it, I immediately start thinking eschatology, end time stuff. When it says the day of the Lord, that's a technical term referring to yet future to our time uh, during the Great Tribulation and that whole package from the rapture until the second coming at least. And sometimes it even includes the millennial kingdom. And when it says it will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations, plural. Do you see that? 
So something's going on here. Everything up to this and everything surrounding it is a judgment on one nation, Egypt. It's all about Egypt. We've got four chapters about Egypt. And yet here God sneaks in this little deal, a time of doom for the nations. When I tie this time of doom for the nations together with the day of the Lord or the great and mighty day of the Lord or that day or the day, you know, lots of ways it's presented, I see eschatology here. I see an end times prophecy. So, do I think it is in his past history before the return from Medio Persia? I believe so. Do I think there's a future as aspect to this? I don't see how you can look at this and not say something's going to happen to Egypt in the future. There's also an aspect that I didn't do, do a slide on of the blessings that Egypt's going to have in the future. During the millennial kingdom, God says in Isaiah that there's going to be a highway from Egypt, uh, from Israel all the way down to Egypt. I haven't seen it or read anything on it. David Hawking, and again, I've quoted him a number of times today, and he's got um, a few more coming up, I believe. He got one of his graduate degrees. I can't remember if it was a master's or a doctorate, one of his doctorates, on Egyptian studies. And he went there and lived in, in Egypt for years and visited every one of these cities and towns that we're talking about and all of these um, pyramids and archaeological ruins and everything else. So he's, he's an expert on Egypt. So I defer to David Hawking on Egypt. He's got a, a, a major degree in it. Um, and I forget why I went there. The day is near, even the day of the Lord. Day. So I think there's this dual aspect of it. There's, oh, oh, I know what David Hawking refers, he's driven this highway. Apparently the highway's built now. It's like a six lane, don't quote me, yeah, I forget if he said it was a four lane highway or a six lane highway that now goes all the way out across this Aswan wilderness he says there's no cars on it, no trucks on it, nobody uses it. He says the only time it gets used is when we take a tour group down there and you can drive this brand new freeway out through the wilderness that, and I think he said that U.S. tax dollars paid for it. And so this highway is built there. Is it the one that's referred to in the millennial kingdom? I can't answer that. Could it be? You betcha. Seems unlikely that somebody would have built a brand new highway to nowhere. But anyway, it's out there, according to David Hawking. Verse 10, thus says the Lord God, I will also make the hordes of Egypt cease by the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar. So we know exactly what this past judgment aspect was done by the king of Babylon. Verse 13, ellipsis. I will also destroy the idols and make the images cease from Memphis, and there will no longer be a prince in the land of Egypt. So we've got a strange mix of fulfilled prophecies and yet unfilled prophecies. Do you think that, let me read the text again, verse 13. God says, I will destroy the idols and make the images cease from Memphis. Do you think idolatry has ceased in Egypt at this point? You can go there and buy an image of everything from a dung beetle on up. ISIS, uh, uh, on the airline, not this time, but many years ago, one of the stewardess ladies had that Egyptian cross hanging on her neck. And at that time, I asked her about it, and she got snippy with me. You know, I said something like, you know, you think that's a Christian cross or whatever, and she bit back at me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's more idolatry. That Egyptian cross is a, for a false god. So what's going on here? God says, I will, that means yet future, destroy the idols and make the images cease. That hasn't happened yet. Is it going to happen? If God says it, you betcha. There's going to be a point in time when there will be no more idolatry in Egypt. What about this? There will no longer be a prince in the land of Egypt. That is fulfilled prophecy mixed right in with it. Just like the 40 years, I believe, is fulfilled prophecy. But, there's, but there, God says there will never be another pharaoh or ruler in Egypt. 
And they're never going to rule the nations again. That's historical fact for now uh, 2,500 years. So you've got this strange mixture, is the way I see it, of yet future, and yet King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came and did his job, and that's ancient history. So you've got both. So I think, and I put on here, there are no double fulfillments in Scripture, okay? There's only one fulfillment of each one of these prophecies. Could it be that some of these prophecies are past tense, some are still future tense to our time frame? I believe so. And there are double references that's allowed in examining the scripture. Uh, and I got another slide there I should have pulled out before uh, verse 6, baby. Thus says the Lord, Indeed, those who support Egypt will fall and the pride of her power will come down from Migdal to Sain. They will fall within her by the sword, declares the Lord God. They will be desolate in the midst of the desolated lands and her cities will be in the midst of the devastated cities. And they will know that I am the Lord. And I don't know that that's happened yet. When I set a fire in Egypt and all her helpers are broken, I'm not aware of any historical evidence of a fire in Egypt yet. And all her helpers are broken. On that day, messengers will go forth from me in ships to frighten, to frighten secure Ethiopia. And anguish will be on them as the day of Egypt. For behold, it comes, says God. Thus says the Lord God. It will also make the hordes of Egypt cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He and his people with him, the most ruthless of the nations, will be brought in to destroy the land. And they will draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. Moreover, I will make the Nile canals dry and sell the land in the hands of evil men. And I will make the land desolate. Who's going to do it? God says he's the one that's made it desolate like it is now. And all that is in it by the hand of strangers, I, the Lord, have spoken. Verse 13. Thus says the Lord God, I also will destroy the idols and make the images cease from Memphis. And there is no longer a prince in the land of Egypt. And I will put fear in the land of Egypt. Verse 14. I will make Pathros desolate, set a fire in Zoan, and execute judgment on Thebes. I will pour out my wrath on Sin. That's an area, geographic area, designated by the name of one of the grandsons of Noah. Sin, the stronghold of Egypt. I will also cut off the hordes of Thebes. Thebes. And I will set a fire in Egypt. Sin will writhe in anguish. Thebes will be breached and Memphis will, be, uh, will have distresses daily. What a prophecy against the, uh, Egypt. Verse 13, though, says, Thus says the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols and make their images cease from Memphis, and there will no longer be a prince in the land of Egypt, and I will put fear in the land of Egypt. And there hasn't been a king in Egypt since then, and I don't expect to ever see one. There will be no more pharaohs of Egypt, and they will no more rule the nations, and there will no more be a crutch for Israel. Verse 17, the young men of On and Beseth, five Bethes, will fall by the sword, and the women will go into captivity. In Tethephesanines, the day will be dark when I break there the yoke bars of Egypt. Then the pride of her power will cease in her. A cloud will cover her, and her daughter will go into captivity. Thus I will execute judgments on Egypt, and they will know that I am the Lord. Verse 20. In the eleventh year, in the first month of the year, so you see we've got another section here, another prophecy. On the seventh of the month, the, sword, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, came to Ezekiel, Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and behold, it has not been bound up for healing or wrapped with a bandage, that it may be strong to hold the sword. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and will break his arms, both the strong and the broken. And I will make the sword fall from his hand. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them from among the lambs. 
For I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hand and I will break the arms of Pharaoh so that he will groan before him with the groanings of a wounded man. Thus I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, but the arms of Pharaoh will fall. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon and he stretches out against the land of Egypt. When I scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the lands, then they will know that I am the Lord. If you look at ancient pictures and carvings and engravings and everything else, the kings always have a scepter in their right hand. They usually have their arms crossed and they'll hold either an 18 to 20 inch long scepter, of, which was the symbol of the capital punishment, the symbol of their great power in their nation, or they have one that's about five feet long, like a staff, and it also would have a killing head on it, a weighted head on the end, sometimes with spikes, sometimes will not. And those, that arm with the scepter is the symbol of power and authority, the kingly rule. And what God's doing here with all those promises to break his right arm and his left arm, make no mistake, God's saying, you're never going to be a major ruling power again. You're never going to have this rule of capital punishment kind of absolute sovereignty. There will be no more pharaohs. Instead, Babylon got it. Verse 20 says, In the 11th year, in the first month, on the 7th of the month, and that's April, I forget the date, first, I think, of 587 B.C. And, the, and this is three months before the fall of Jerusalem, according to the Rivi Study Bible. So we're right on the threshold of this huge transformation when God's going to send King Neb and wipe out the temple and all of Jerusalem and haul the last of any wealth and valuable people off to Babylon. All he's going to leave behind is the broken, burned ruins and a few peasant farmers to maintain the land. And no more vassal king, no more big deal. He's hauling it all off, every temple and movement and all of the valuable people, if you would and leaving behind this smoking rubble. And when he did that, all that was left, we believe, was the, um, the Solomon's temple, was the, the uh, Solomon's colonnades. You know, a row of deals. Everything else is smoking and rubble. Bible Knowledge Commentary says, this prophecy was written shortly after Tyre's surrender to Babylon in 572 B.C., and for 13 years, King Neb was besieged the city of Tyre from 585 to 572. So this is right on that threshold of, the, of it. So, in closing, uh, this, Judith and I were blessed to get to go through this cave in the uh, White, Waitomo Glowworm Caves in New Zealand. And, uh, and I found this picture of it. It really is pretty cool. Tiny little worms, but they, but they bio fluoresce and it, you can turn off your lights and walk through this cave by the light of the glow worms and they're very very protective of it they won't let you take flash photography they won't let you touch anything they're 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 going out of their way to protect those little worms in there because it's a phenomenon and so i say go forth as the light of the worm at least as good as these glow worms do huh so the end three men Three crosses, one hill. One man cursed, one man prayed, one man promised. One man, one man died condemned, one died forgiven, one died innocent. One died in sin, one died to sin, and one died for sin. One was held by death, one was released by death, and one conquered death. One lost life, one gained life, one was life. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, and praise God, we have eternal life. So, any questions, comments, guys? Let me, let me get to this thing so I can end my recording again.